Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today there was just a general request, I can't remember by who, to cover more of the Lost Era while we've covered the Tomed incident. We actually haven't covered the true sort of golden era of Starfleet, and critically one thing that I wanted to do was compare the Ambassador class to the Probert class. Now, Full disclosure, when I was writing this video, I very quickly realised that there was no way I was going to be able to do a proper video on the Ambassador and then also talk about the Probert slash Narendra class without it being horrendously long. Therefore, I've decided to split it into two videos. So in this particular video, we're going to be talking about the Ambassador class. Then in the next video, we'll be comparing it to the Narendra class. So really what we're going to be talking about in this video is how the Ambassador class brought Starfleet into the 24th century. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing to understand is that, well, depending on when you think the Ambassador class was launched, it would imply that actually the Excelsior class had a relatively short lifespan. Uh, earliest dates put the Ambassador launching at about 2325, which means that Excelsior had been in service as the flagship for only about 35 years, and even then, only 25 of those were probably completely uncontested by 23rd century vessels. Things like the Constitution were probably only decommissioned by the end of the 2290s. So the Excelsior has only really had 25 years as the true flagship. So all that is to say that Starfleet kind of fell out with the Excelsior going into the 24th century. There are many reasons for this. Uh, it is a fundamentally 23rd century design. It is first and foremost, as all ships from the 23rd century, a combat vessel. There's all this rhetoric and, and sort of historical revisionism that Starfleet wasn't making warships. They absolutely were making warships with scientific capabilities as well. The, the difference between a warship and a science ship were, were far smaller then as they are compared to like in the 24th century where these are now highly specialized domains. Uh, in the 23rd century, every ship is a warship, every ship is a science ship, so on and so forth. Critically, the Excelsior is designed as a battle cruiser, and so in that way it is very much constrained in what it can do. The other thing to point out is that the Excelsior class was still running on duotronic computers, and already this system is becoming incredibly strained. The other thing to mention is that Excelsior has a warp-powered impulse drive. This means that your impulse drive is tied into the functioning of your warp core. If your warp core is not running, your impulse reactors aren't running, and you're dead in the water completely. So it's a system that while it offers a lot more power and a lot more efficiency, you don't have any redundancy. And so there's benefits to that, there's also costs. It also only had a Gen 1 vertical warp core. It's basically built shortly after the Constitution refits and thus mounts a similar size warp core, albeit it's just better integrated into the design. At its heart, it's still only a Gen 1 vertical warp core. And there's also the other limitations you have to consider besides the warp core, those being what are the ratings of the power conduits? what are the ratings of other components. You can't just simply upgrade a warp core and the ship will work. If you do that, your ship's power grid might get overloaded or the various systems that you are channeling energy to might just get burned out. So sometimes it is just easier to build a new ship, particularly if you're building a whole new warp core that's, generation, that's a whole generation ahead of the prior version. And then going back to the fact that this was intended as a battle cruiser, it sacrificed capacity for speed. There was very limited room for growth in the design. And in the grand scheme of things, there was relatively limited future proofing. We're well, well before the days of truly modular and adaptable starships. Uh, the only ship that really comes close in this time period is still the Miranda class. And that's still external things. So. Ultimately, Excelsior is not that configurable, particularly with the technology of the time. Qu 
quite difficult to upgrade. And this means that it has relatively limited applications. A good example of that is that this has a tiny shuttle bay. It only has one shuttle bay, it's on the back, and it is only slightly bigger than on the Constitution class, despite Excelsior being many times bigger, not just in length, but also in volume, and yet it still has the same size shuttle bay. And then another good example is that it has, relatively speaking, weak shields. The first Excelsiors probably actually mounted the same shields as on the Constitution, which were rated for six torpedoes. By later in its career, perhaps that had gone up to eight to ten, but in the grand scheme of things, that's still not much, and that's still pretty fragile. And this is important because with the Tomed incident, there was a shift in thinking in Starfleet Command. There was a renewed focus on more defensive systems rather than offensive systems, and survivability became far more significant over firepower. So Starfleet was also looking for ships with better shielding first, and was less concerned with more advanced weaponry, and critically it was also looking for more efficient weaponry, rather than just more guns. And this really marks a new approach to the design of tactical systems, and how starships will operate in the new battle space. And this led Starfleet in 2315 to launch the Renaissance class. It's only a little bit bigger than an Excelsior class, but it's still a substantial upgrade, and critically you can see a lot of the technologies that will make it into the Ambassador class. This critically is more of a technology demonstrator than it is an actual Starship class. This is a prototype rather than a full design. However, we can see going forward that there's a number of features that will make it onto future designs. First and foremost, there is a new hull plan. The Renaissance features a far more voluminous hull, going back almost to the early 23rd century style of design with large cylindrical hulls. This increased volume significantly and it had a far greater suite of capabilities than a standard Excelsior class. However, there were a lot of compromises in this design as well. It still had an old warp core, its nacelles were really modified Excelsior nacelles, it still mounted the same warp-powered impulse drive. However, there was one notable addition to this design, which really marks it as a departure from Excelsior and other ships of previous eras. This ship mounted a new type of weapon, and just like the HMS Warrior several centuries before, this design changed everything. All right, Drek, so uh, where are we and what is all of this here? Right, so we are on the bow of HMS Warrior with uh, the slightly disappointing Armstrong 110 pounder. But uh, the main reason we're here is not to talk about how terrible that is, because I think I've done that to the death in quite a few different videos. What we're here to talk about is all of this. And this is not some kind of, you know, chaotic summoning circle or an imprisonment device for the spirit of the, the rebellious machine spirit of the 110 pounder. <laughs> this is actually all part of the mechanism that's supposed to allow you to position it in multiple places, because this is obviously just the one gun currently pointing, it's pointing at the bow. But as we pan around, you can see you've got two starboard bow chaser positions and two port bow chaser positions. And if we come round over here, we can see that the whole gun is on a friction carriage. So it's not on a wheeled carriage or a half wheel carriage like most of the ship's guns are. It just slides. So how do you get it from here, given that this thing weighs quite a few tons, to any of these one positions? And that's where all of this comes in. Right, so the reason I wanted to look at this is because in the motion picture we have the phaser batteries and again we can sort of look even further back. That's commonly how phasers are employed on starships until you get to the 24th century and then suddenly we start seeing phaser arrays and in my mind actually this is a very similar answer to that kind of problem which is traversing your weapon in a more efficient way. If you're having to then position guns at every single of these gun ports, then that's an awful lot more weight, whereas you can be a little bit more efficient with just one gun that you can scoot in multiple positions, and that's much the same as the, the phaser 
array as compared to the phaser battery, which is ultimately static. And it's very good, particularly, for responding to attacks from unknown vectors. You don't have to have a phaser battery in that exact place. A phaser array covers a far wider arc. It's much more useful against flanking attacks. So, yeah, so if you had your phaser battery, the original TOS one, that would be like having 410 pounders all fixed in position. Mm. And then your phaser array, this one, you just have a single 110 pound, you can still cover all your arcs. But you've now saved the weight of three guns, at which point you can have three more guns elsewhere. Exactly. So it's saving space. And then, yeah, that then means that you look at ships like the Enterprise D, particularly, which is at the height of the phaser array, and it's just covered in them with phasers in positions where they just didn't have them before. And that's all because of the phaser array and the difference that that makes. Right, let's see what else we can find that parallels between Ironclad Warrior and uh, Star Trek. I'm sure very, very much confusing some of the other guests. <laughs> So as far as Starfleet is concerned, the Renaissance class is moving in the right direction, but it still falls short of many requirements. Fundamentally, what Starfleet is looking for in their new cruiser is longevity and adaptability. This is going to go out further than anyone has gone before, and it is going to be doing it for longer periods of time. And so as far as Starfleet was concerned, it wasn't enough for their new class to have just a few new gadgets. It had to be a wholesale evolution of Starship design as we knew it. So the project continues for another 10 years and in 2325, the first Ambassador class ships launch from Utopia Planitia. The Ambassador launches with 100% new technology. There is not a single old bone in its body. In terms of new features, we have a new warp core, which is a third as big again as the warp core carried on board Excelsior class starships. It has a new independent impulse drive powered by its own fusion reactors. This is partially due to improvements in fusion drive technology. And critically, the difference between previous iterations of impulse units is that this has much better thrust vectoring capabilities. So even though it only takes up a small portion of the hull, it is able to vector its thrust and allow powered maneuvering, which is a very important aspect of just steering a starship. While you can of course steer a starship using thrusters, by using vectored thrust from an impulse engine, you're able to get far better responsiveness and very, very quick course changes, which is in reality what maneuvering in space is all about. If you maneuver with thrusters without your main driver, you're just changing the orientation of your ship. You're not changing the direction in which it is moving. However, if you change direction using your impulse drive, you will change your direction of travel. And that is very, very important to note because a lot of people seem to think that it's about thrusters that dictate ship's maneuverability. It is not. It is the impulse drive which dictates a starship's maneuverability. Weapons-wise, we see a complete change in thinking. This features the new phaser strips, which, as previously mentioned, were a game-changer, particularly when it came to dealing with the threat of cloaked enemy vessels. It also mounted two new photon torpedo launchers. These were capable of burst fire. Now, it's worth saying that they were only allowed to have two torpedo launchers. It was felt that ships from the late 23rd century, which often mounted four or more torpedo tubes, were far too aggressive and also were just taking up ridiculous amounts of space. And it was decided that actually, if they could get it down to a single launcher, not only would that appear far less aggressive, but it would also far simplify safety procedures in terms of the handling of photon torpedoes. But these are capable of three round bursts, so you can load into these launch apertures up to three torpedoes at once, and they can engage multiple targets, although that generally wasn't done all that much because of the computing it required. Speaking of computing, it featured new isolinear computers. Uh, it, now, it's worth making clear that isolinear computer systems do not replace duotronic systems. Every single ship with isolinear systems still has a duotronic core. If you look on the specifications of any ship of the 24th century, 
there are still two separate computer cores. Sometimes there's even more than two separate computer cores, and those are effectively your duotronic systems. But what the isolinear system does is distribute computing power across the ship. So really, the computer cores can be seen as essentially your, your hard drives, while processing is spread out among the isolinear systems across the ship. So this is a much more networked computer system, which is able to chain together the smaller computer systems to achieve faster processing power and faster speeds. In many ways, very much like the phaser arrays, the idea of chaining together a number of singular systems to form a greater whole. And this allows the computer systems to carry out multiple complex tasks at once. And what this means is that automation frees up crew. And of course, once you free up crew, you've got to decide what you're going to do with them. Okay, so we're now down in the main gun deck, and this is doubles also as the main crew quarters. And that does raise an interesting question, which is, on any kind of ship, what is most of the crew doing? Some ships will have crew devoted to propulsion and some weapons. The question really comes down to whether or not you want crew devoted to weapons or propulsion. Mm -hmm. So obviously on Warrior, unlike some later ships, you know, the turreted ships that we're familiar with from World War I, World War II, or even actually turreted warships from later on in the 19th century, Warrior just has a lot of guns, so it's much more like an age of sail warship. And in fact, the whole design is kind of gripped from the Mersey and the Orlando, so she's basically a wooden frigate in iron, if you want to be really crude about it. So you can see some of the guns there, and as we come round, you see even more guns there, and there, this is just in the Citadel, so beyond the Citadel there's a few more for other reasons, and each of these guns requires over a dozen men to fight. So multiply that by the you know, several dozen guns on the ship, and suddenly the vast majority of your crew is fighting the ship. Yes, and going back to the example of phaser batteries, so in the original series era, we see that there's a phaser room, there's a specific room, and that probably only controls maybe one phaser battery. Mm. And again, you see in the wrath of car, a very large torpedo bay, which is going to be a very involved process. Jump to TNG, and it just looks like the ship's weapons are just operated by Worf behind a single console. So there's a lot of automation that's happened there. Yeah, and you see that pretty much, you know, yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Because the, these kinds of, these 68 pounders, well, say, will have a crew of just over a dozen men per yeah. gun. But when you go forward to, let's say, something like HMS Belfast, the cruiser only has a dozen guns, the actual gun crew, you know, not counting people down in the magazines, which will also <laughs> exist on Warrior, but the actual gun crew for a six inch gun on Belfast has not increased hugely compared to this 68 pounder, even though it's a much longer range, much more powerful weapon, and even if you go up onto a battleship, if you go to one of the preserved US ones or look at some of the documentation for a British one, although their gun crews are slightly larger than Belfast's, again, you're not talking about a massive jump compared to these relatively small, at least in lengthwise, uh, 68 pounders, and that's obviously a huge saving because you've got fewer guns, because they're a lot more powerful, and not that many more people per gun, so your overall numbers of people operating your main battery as a proportion of your overall crew has decreased hugely mm -hmm. compared to the, you know, this era of ironclads. And that frees up crew to do other things, for example, running the engines. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at uh, even just before Warrior, look at Victory over, uh, over there, Age of Sail, and to be honest, even in Warrior's time period, a lot of merchant ships are still purely sail powered. A lot of merchant ships in that time period, they were sailing with crews 20, 30, 40 people in ships that were often as large or roughly in the ballpark as major capital warships. But the major capital warships are going around with crews measured in the mid to high hundreds. Dimensionally, there's not a lot in it. The main difference is that on a merchant ship, all you've got to do is sail it from point A to point B. All that extra crew is on the warship is coming from that. You have to fight yes. it and supply the men who are fighting it. Yes, it's a whole different ball game when you're running a warship. Yes, 
which is I mean, think you know, relating it to again to the way Star Trek works with its automation. Automation will massively cut down on things. So skipping forward from wire, the two carriers, Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, are out there at the moment. They're very modern designs. They use automation to actually massively cut down the number of crew that they actually need to run. Once you get the air group on board, it goes up a bit. But you compare that to slightly older large carrier designs like some of the Nimitz class. They have massively larger crews. Yes, they are slightly larger ships, but proportional to the overall size of the ship, they they have much greater manpower requirements. So the automation allows the Royal Navy with a relatively small manpower pool to operate the QEs. Whereas I think if the QEs have the same manpower density as the American carriers do, mm-hmm. there's no way we're going to be operating. <laughs> we're those. not going to be operating that. Um, and that then, as I go further forward in the future to something like Star Trek, if you look at the way that some ships can be operated by the bridge crew, or in the case of Year of Hell at the end, okay, it's a little bit of karma cars you run, but Janeway, at least for a while, can run the ship on one person yeah. with all that automation. Maybe it won't last very long, and it's not particularly effective in battle, but it can technically be done yeah. compared to you know, the number of men you, and women you need aboard to actually fully operate the ship if it's going to fight, explore, etc., etc. Yeah, and automation was done as early as, as original series with a lot of the cargo ships. Those were just completely automated. That's in the ultimate computer. Mm. So already at that point, automation in a lot of sort of support roles has already been taken care of. Yeah. And that's obviously not to say that there's no need for the crew in Star mm. Trek because automation can break, automation has limits. Um, you know, that we have people like Data, but Data is a unique mm. individual for the most part if we ignore law. <laughs> yeah. He's a uniquely stable AI. He yes. hasn't tried to murder everybody yet. It's very exceptional yes. in that universe. So at that point, you know, therefore, automated computer systems are always going to have their limits on what they can do, how much they can self-repair, and when you come up with unique circumstances, situations, or this thing is broken, we need to reroute, repair, etc. That's when you need the human crew. Apart from also making the decision about what you actually want to do. Yes. Yes, and there's nothing quite as stressful and unpredictable as a battle. No, exactly. So the Ambassador class, in all likelihood, had a complement of probably something in the region of 900. While I've seen various manuals state that it only had a crew of about 500, I find that extremely unlikely, given how close in size the Ambassador class is to its eventual successor, the Galaxy class. 900 seems like a pretty good equivalent it's still less than the galaxy class but it's still way more than an excelsior class by the way if you only gave it 500 crew that would put it at basically the same level of crew as an excelsior class and only 50 more than a constitution refit which doesn't make much sense as technology gets better our ability to operate at a larger scale increases and therefore the incentive to have a larger crew And speaking of that capabilities and increased capacities, the Ambassador class has two shuttle bays. Yes, the Miranda class had two shuttle bays. They're more like garages rather than full flight decks. These are two full flight decks. And that is really, really worth noting. This is way beyond just a small little door out of which a single small shuttle pod pops which is what you really get on things like the Constellation. These are full-size, fully equipped shuttle bays, each with a full complement of shuttlecraft. And it massively, massively increases the operational scope of the Ambassador class, especially when you take into account how shuttles are advancing and quite quickly. Finally, we have new nacelles. These cells, interestingly, feature fewer warp coils, but they are much much larger and this allows for increased efficiency you're losing far less energy as the plasma is transmitted down the line Uh, however these are slower to produce these are big big warp coils and they take a long time to produce and the other thing because there's less of them and because they're relatively speaking a lot more durable than smaller coils they are much less maintenance intensive than say an Excelsior which not only has lots of coils but they tend to burn out a lot more quickly. The downside of this of course being that these coils are very expensive and very very slow to produce. That's very important because 
Ambassador is not intended to replace Excelsior. Excelsior in this point has been built in huge numbers and is still very much serving as the workhorse of Starfleet. And they do not want to use the Ambassador to just take over the role of workhorse. They have something, Starfleet Command has something very, very different in mind for Ambassador. With Ambassador, they see her as a completely new concept. That being the long range dedicated explorer. Now I've been very sarcastic before when describing ships like the Galaxy class as a explorer when it is a battleship. Both things are fundamentally true at the same time. The Galaxy class is indeed a long range explorer and it is also a battleship. It being a battleship does not contradict it being an explorer and vice versa. But these are fundamentally different modes of thinking. It's a explorer that just also happens to be a battleship and that would perhaps be the best way of describing the situation with the ambassador. Yes, it's a heavy cruiser, it conforms to that kind of doctrine of the 23rd century. It in many ways is just a jumbo connie, but it's also something completely new, that being this idea of the long range exploration cruiser. Again, which has never really been done before. The, the Constitution and Excelsior were both built very much as heavy cruisers and fast battleships first, and then their exploration capabilities very much came second. This is engineered fundamentally as a platform for long-range exploration and to be adaptable to those kinds of missions. Now let's get into the service of the Ambassador class and some of its successes and some of its failures. So the first thing to talk about is the isolinear computers. We all know very much about the bioneural systems used on board the Intrepid class and how sordid an affair that was. In fairness, the situation for the Ambassador was much the same. The Isolinear system actually had a bit of a tendency early on to kind of just crash. Uh, the system almost sort of overloaded itself or communication between the subsystems would break down. It is extremely vulnerable to cyber attacks and to viruses. Uh, if a virus gets into an Isolinear system, it's very, very difficult to track down and destroy. In the old Duotronic systems, if one of the two computers was infected, basically the two computers were keeping tabs on one another at all times, they were constantly scanning each other, and each had a backup for the other. So if one computer became infected, it would be immediately quarantined and shut down. The other core could maintain critical systems, and the infected core would be shut down, purged, and then have its backup uploaded to the clean core. It was a very simple but very effective way of protecting the computers from various kinds of cyber threats. Whereas the isolinear system, because it is so distributed and so heavily networked, it's a, once a virus gets into that system, it can spread very, very quickly, and it can be an absolute pain to remove, often requiring a return to Starbase. However, that's not to say that the isolinear computers are a complete and utter failure. That is just unfair. Isolinear computers allowed the Ambassador class to cover far more ground, far more quickly, to chart space and systems at a speed never seen before. The Isolinear systems are fundamentally what made the Ambassador such a capable exploration vessel. Sensors and all those kinds of hardware, those had advanced a little bit from the 23rd century and they were certainly a lot better, but critically it was, it was the superior power of the new computers that allowed the Ambassador class to chart systems in half the time of previous starships, and that meant that it covered a lot more ground. Not to mention, it's better engines, better speeds, all these things factor together to mean that the frontiers of the Federation expanded incredibly fast in this time period, and it is largely thanks to the advancements of the Ambassador. We also saw that the new impulse drive did incredibly well, it was able to it was powerful, responsive, and maneuverable. So maneuverable that it was able to outmaneuver the current generation of Romulan warbirds, the Vamalax. There was, however, one small problem, and that there was no redundancy. And critically, if the Ambassador ever separated its saucer, 
its saucer section had absolutely no impulse power of its own and simply moved on thrusters and so was completely unpowered effectively dead in the water so that was something to be taken into consideration its new weapons were excellent in 1v1 combat in terms of defending itself the ambassador was absolutely impenetrable almost it took multiple ships attacking simultaneously to bring an ambassador class down 1v1 there was absolutely nothing in the quadrant that could take it on and that's exactly what starfleet wanted starfleet did not want this ship to fight wars starfleet wanted this ship to be able to go about its business freely and protect itself and in that it was very very capable of doing so its new phaser arrays meant that it didn't have a blind spot and its new torpedo launchers though they're a shadow of what was to come meant that it was very capable of alpha striking most targets and leading them to have second thoughts furthermore its shielding was second to none again you had to attack it effectively with multiple ships in order to have a hope of breaking through and even then it was going to be a pretty long process especially with older generations of weapons however it's worth saying that the ambassador class was not oppressive in combat when it was deployed in the cardassian border wars it was very good especially as a command ship and yes 1v1 it absolutely could take on any cardassian vessel and win the cardassians were not stupid they knew that starfleet had the better ships and always always attacked in numbers and then of course starfleet would be obliged to respond with numbers and in that the ambassador actually kind of gets a little bit lost it's good it's rock solid and it's an excellent base of fire but it wasn't oppressive the cardassians never ran from it in the way that actually they ran from older 23rd century vessels they didn't mind the ambassador class so much they'd never beat it but they knew they could hold it off it was big it was heavy they just send three echoes against it and it, they'll probably have to fall back but they can slow it down very easily again it wasn't particularly oppressive in combat because it was never designed with a particular combat niche for it to exploit it was only designed to defend itself and in that it's excellent but in terms of being part of a wider military machine it just isn't part of a wider military machine that just doesn't exist in the 24th century they just don't believe in that anymore so in conclusion the ambassador class was really pioneered as a new concept in starship design a move away from the excelsior and the ways of the 23rd century the ambassador first and foremost represents a change in thinking while there is new and exciting technologies in there that will go forward in the 24th century and give us the ships that we know and love ultimately that's not what makes the ambassador class the ambassador class and gives it its identity and made it so successful it was the change in mentality with which starfleet applied these new technologies to create something completely novel and to go where no one has gone before and in some ways actually it was kind of a rough first draft thank you guys for watching i hope you all enjoyed like i say i will pick this up with a video on the narendra class but until then leave your thoughts in the comments below special thanks to the wonderful folks over at the fourth combined fleet who provided those beautiful beautiful star trek online renders that you will have been seeing in this video thank you to my members my Navox, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, Rella, and Macross Schaffer. My commanders, Philip Ty, Bird Monster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Narata, Nathaniel Mead, Gabe Logan, DM Tribal Typhoon, Nicholas Walsh, Martin McConville, JC Tech Wizard, Rizel 3D, James C, Alcara Dreamer, Joe G. Turd Ferguson, and you don't know Trek. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, John Nicole, Athy's Collection, Greg Martin, Shermos, Mazarin, and Bird of Play D3. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.